I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Tali Sherritt, a leading expert on human decision-making, optimism, and emotion. A neuroscientist by trade, Tali combines research in psychology, behavioral economics, and neuroscience to reveal the forces that shape our decisions, beliefs, and inaccurate expectations of the future. She's currently a visiting professor at MIT and is also an associate professor of cognitive neuroscience at University College in London, where she directs the Affective Brain Lab. She is the author of The Influential Mind, The Science of Optimism, and The Optimism Bias. Our conversation tackles many of the issues Tali has studied in her career, including the optimism bias, sense of control, confirmation bias, behavioral change, and overconfidence. We then touch on some of the applications of her work to investing, including the home country bias, making non-economic financial decisions, active management, emotion-driven decisions, team-based decisions, and research heuristics. Lastly, we learn a few parenting tricks from the influential mind. This conversation took place behind closed doors at the Context Summit Thought Leadership Forum in Las Vegas. I've asked the head of Context, Ron Biscardi, to say a few words about the event and his company. Our Thought Leadership Summit in Las Vegas was our first shift into the thought leadership genre of conferences. We are actually known for something called Capital Introduction Conferences, which we've run for five years now. And our event in Miami, which takes place every January, February timeframe, is the largest capital introduction conference in the world in the alternative space. We had over 2,000 attendees this year in 2018 and over 650 investors and more than 600 alternative investment fund managers attended. And the purpose of this event is to, in essence, create one-on-one meetings between those participants so that they can figure out who's worth doing business with. And is money still flowing in alternatives? Believe it or not, it is. In spite of a lot of the headlines, the assets in the hedge fund asset class in particular have continued to grow over the last several years. And there is a tremendous amount of activity taking place at our events annually. We we know anecdotally there's billions of dollars moving through the, that event every year. Well, Ron, I know you're also up to a bunch of other stuff, and so we may have to sit down for a full conversation in the not-too-distant future. Happy to do it. Thanks, Ted. Thanks. With that as an introduction, please enjoy my conversation with Tali Sherrod. Tali, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So how does somebody become a cognitive neuroscientist? Well, you know what? I actually was always interested in the brain. I mean, I I can remember myself being interested in psychology and in neuroscience since I was a teenager. Even things like, you know, I read Freud and so on. And so I always knew this is what I wanted to do. But when I did my undergraduate in Israel, there wasn't actually a neuroscience degree at all in the whole country. So I had to choose something else. And so I chose, actually, originally, I decided I would do math and chemistry. (laughs) And then just days before I was to start in Tel Aviv University, I changed it to psychology and economics. And so I did my first degree in psychology and economics. And I was mostly interested in my course on biological psychology. And actually, I had no intention at the time, I didn't know you could combine psychology and economics. I mean, this was like the mid 90s. But from there, I then went to do a neuroscience PhD in New York University. And now what I study is this combination between neuroscience, psychology, and economics, or behavioral economics. And so, yeah, that's that's how it came about. And was there a focus within that? Was it more on the brain? It was more on applied psychology to economics? My interest is comes from curiosity about how the brain works, but mostly it's actually from 
understanding other people and understanding myself. But really to understand people, to understand people's behavior, emotion, how they think, you really under- need to understand the brain. So I think it, it came from this curiosity of why do people do what they do? that kind of thing. And so what did you find? What did I find? <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> There's only a few books you've written about it. Well, I was really intrigued about the mistakes that people make. So I read Daniel Kahneman's work when I was in Tel Aviv University. So this was the, the mid-90s, so before he got the Nobel Prize. But we had to read his work for one of our courses in economics. And it made a lot of sense to me. These biases that people have, you know, these illusions of what we believe about ourselves, which is not always the same as reality. And some of these illusions are good for us in some ways and in other ways not so much. And so I was, I'm really intrigued in these mistakes How do they come about? Why do they come about? And by understanding that, what can we do about them? So are there a few that you like to highlight of the mistakes that we make? Right. So obviously the most, the work that I'm probably best known for, especially outside of neuroscience, is the optimism bias. And that is the idea that people tend to overestimate their likelihood of experiencing positive events in their lives, like having talented kids or doing really well professionally and financially and underestimating the likelihood of negative events, such as people underestimate the likelihood of divorce, underestimate the likelihood of getting cancer, which is about 30% in the population, you know, underestimating um, all sorts of, of negative events. And I was specifically interested in how is that possible? How is it possible that we have this optimism bias? Because What's surprising is that we have lots of information and if you have an expectation and you get information that contradicts it, you should correct yourself. So then over time, we shouldn't really have these kind of biases, but we do. And so what my research has shown is that we maintain this optimism bias and we it's generated because we learn a little bit better from unexpected positive information than unexpected negative information. So for example, if I were to tell you, you know, you're going to get two million listeners for this podcast. Oh, yeah, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> I don't know what your usual rate is. I don't know. I have no idea. A little idea. bit less than I that. I feel, okay. So you'd be like, oh, really? Yeah, okay. You would take that in and say, well, maybe she's right. But if I tell you, you know, I don't think anyone's going to listen to this anymore because of this and that, you'd say, ah, she doesn't know what she's talking about. This is going to really take on. So if we do that throughout life again and again and again, that means that we will generate positive expectations, expectations that are a little bit better than than reality. And is that true of ourselves and our outlook on other people? Or is it just we each to ourselves think more optimistically about what's likely to happen? So it is specific to ourselves and our group around us or our family, for example. And actually, we call that private optimism and public despair. So this interesting conflict where on one side, people are quite optimistic about themselves. We see this in 80% of the population. But at the same time, we are pessimistic about the rest of the world. We're pessimistic about what's going on in our country and our leaders on average. So people, for example, in, in the UK, there's people tend to say the NHS, which is kind of the medical care, is, is terrible, you know, it's really bad, but my own doctor is great. So we tend to be quite pessimistic about others. And there's a few reasons for this. One reason that I highlight is control. We believe our future will be good because we believe we can direct the wheel in the right direction, but we don't have control over the world at large and over our leaders. And so we're more pessimistic about that. Another reason may be that if we think, for example, this happened after the, the financial collapse, there were surveys asking people about what do they think their financial future is going to be like. And they were quite optimistic about their own financial future, even after the collapse, while at the same time, they were quite pessimistic about everyone else's financial future. A great recent example came from asking people, okay, there's AI is going to take over many jobs. What do you think about that? And people said, yes, I think it's going to take over many jobs, but not my own. Okay, right. so this is another another example. So I'm going to be better off than most people. That makes you even more optimistic, right? Yeah. Not only are you going to do well, you're going to do well while the others are not going to do as well. And that really picks And up. we're here at the Context Conference in Las Vegas. is a hedge fund conference. And one of the things that we see in the hedge fund industry is that most investors are kind of skeptical of hedge funds as a whole, but they're very positive on the hedge fund managers that they've picked for their portfolio. So if that's true, that that's part of an example of an optimism bias, is there anything... People, is that something to correct or is it just to recognize that it exists? 
Well, it depends. <laughs> so you need to think about what are the consequences of this. I mean, what are the positive consequences and what are the negative consequences? So for example, the positive consequence in believing that, you know, your team, team is especially great is that it enhances your motivation. You know, you, you think, well, our team, my team is great. We're going to do well. And then you get up in the morning, early in the morning, you go to the office, you work, you know, if you think like, ah, we're just going to do like as bad as everyone else, you don't put in the effort. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you take people's bias, if you were able to, and you, you really are not, but if you were able to just take away this optimism bias, that wouldn't necessarily be very good for motivation. On the negative side, you might take overly, you know, take too many risks that you shouldn't, right? And so what one needs to do is to figure out the possible positive outcomes and the possible negative outcomes and then correct for the outcomes, not for the bias. So if you if we kind of work this through and we think, okay, because we are overly optimistic about our team and we believe, you know, we're going to do well, better than the others, we might not have like a plan B, for example. Okay. So it doesn't mean you change your estimate of like how well you're going to do. You just at the same time have a plan B. All right. So that's kind of the idea. So you're filling in the vacuum that you'll leave by being overly optimistic, by making sure that you've fully emphasized, say like the downside case or whatever the other side of your thinking is. Yeah. Or, I mean, it depends on what the negative outcome is that, that you think is possible. You know, if you think, oh, people are putting in too much money, you know, too quickly or something like that, then there are ways to alert people in real time, for example. You might want to, to alert people, oh, you are now X amount more than, you know, blah, 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 alert, and then and put in a, a potential option to correct your actions. It's very difficult to correct people's predictions and to correct the bias in how they process information, but you can change the outcome. So for example, let me give you an example. People renovate their house, and usually when they're about to renovate their house, they underestimate the budget and underestimate how long it's going to take. Same thing with planning weddings, for example. And so people put in their estimates, but now if they realize they have a bias and you're probably not putting enough of, you know, enough in, you would want to correct for that by putting in an extra amount. You still believe that it's going to be fine. You still believe it's going to take me six months. At the end, it takes two years, right? You still believe that, but you say, well, we know, I'm, I know that there's a bias and therefore I will put in a side more and, you know, I will have a plan of what's going to happen if they don't finish renovating in six months and I'm going to have to live somewhere for, for two years. I mean, this, this is very common. So these are the kind of things that, that you could be doing. And one of the things you touched on is this notion of control and the desire to control your environment. How does that filter into how the brain works? One thing that we see is that when you give people a choice or a sense of control, the reward center in the brain is activated. It signals a reward just as it does for actual rewards for like food and money. So the brain responds to the option to make choices by signaling a reward signal, just as if I was just about to give you, you know, a chocolate cake now. So why does it do that? Because in fact, our likelihood of surviving is higher when we have an ability to make choices because A, we're probably going to make the choices that are better for us. And so that's a good thing. And you can see that even in, you know, kids, kids want to make their own choices and everyone kids and adults get quite anxious when they don't. This is why one reason people are really anxious on planes. It's not only the fear of flying per se, but it is once you're in the plane, you have no control. You're not the pilot, right? Someone else is directing the plane. You don't even have control about what are you going to eat or drink, right? It's very limited. So your your control is very much limited. And that response is anxiety. So having control, the response is reward. Limiting control, the response is anxiety. But it's really quite adaptive for the brain to treat control as a reward because, for example, let's say I just give you $100. You're happy. You know, there's a reward signal in the brain. Now, imagine that you did something for me to give you $100. Maybe you build a little chair that I bought for $100. Well, now you have a blueprint of how to earn $100. If I was just to give you $100... Well, it's not guaranteed that anyone will give you $100 in the future or that I will give you $100 again. But if you did something for those $100, you build a chair or something and I gave you $100, now you have a blueprint and you know how 
is it possible for you to gain more and more money in the future? And so it is quite sensible for us to desire to have agency and control. Right. So I'm picking up these little nuggets of every time there's a problem, you've thought of a a potential remedy. What are the sort of set of ways that we can help work around the problems that we have really in decision making? Yeah. So for every, you know, you have to to kind of consider every bias. It's not, there's not one answer for this. Obviously, the first thing we need to do is be aware. Okay, so we need, I mean, it's great that uh, people are now aware of Kahneman's and Traversky's work and other people like them because now people are more aware of these biases. So confirmation bias, for example, which also we've done a lot of work on, is the tendency to us to take in information that already confirms what we believe and to tend to relatively ignore information that contradicts it. For example, we did a a study where we brought people into our lab in pairs, and we had them make financial decisions together. Specifically, they had to assess real estate. And while they were doing that, we also scanned their brains in two brain imaging scanners, but they could interact over the internet. And so what we found that when the two people agreed on how much um, real estate was worth, each person's brain was closely monitoring the information coming from the partner. And everyone became more confident in their decision, right? Because, well, we agree, so we're probably right, and and they became confident. When the two disagreed, we found that the brain was shutting down. It wasn't actually taking in the information coming from the disagreeing partner. And people's confidence in their own decision didn't change much. So they learned that the other person disagrees with them, but yet their confidence remained relatively stable. Now, this is an example of a confirmation bias. So if we know that we have a confirmation bias, and this obviously can cause great mistakes, right? Because, you know, information that contradicts it is coming in, but we ignore it. Well, that's a recipe for, for mistakes. I think one way to overcome this is to have your decisions and predictions assessed by people who don't necessarily hold the same theories as you do and don't necessarily have the same motivations as you do. So this is something that's very common in science. Uh, Although it doesn't work perfectly well, but it works relatively well, well, I think. So, for example, before we publish anything, we publish a finding, it is reviewed by other people who don't necessarily have a strong theory one way or another and don't have a motivation. I have a motive. If I have a theory, I have a motivation to confirm that theory because it's my theory, right? I know it. And so, obviously, I might ignore or not notice data that contradicts it. But if I then give you my data and reasoning and, and whatever, and you don't necessarily have a prior about this, you'll be better able to assess it and say mm, yes or no. So if any kind of decision can then be assessed by other people who come from you know a different group, or that, that is one way. I know a lot of the research you've done on things like compliance with thinking about like hand washing in hospitals, there are a bunch of things that people know they should do for health reasons, whatever it is, or employees, but don't. How do you get people to conform with things that everyone would agree are probably beneficial? Can talk a little bit about the things you've learned uh, in that process? If we talk about the hand washing study that was done by a, a group of scientists in New York State, you know, the problem that they had was that people in, in hospital medical staff weren't washing their hands before and after interacting with patients. They knew perfectly well that this could cause a spread of disease. But the problem is that knowing that something bad might happen in the future is simply not enough motivation to get us to act today. And this is a common problem. I mean, we know if we drink too much, smoke, if we don't go, don't exercise, we don't eat healthily, bad things might happen in the future. But it's in the future, so it's far away. And plus, we think, ah, it's going to be fine, right? Because usually we tend to learn less from from negative information. So we tend to ignore it and, and we're optimistic and we say it's fine. And so what that means is that simple warnings is not enough. We need to use another approach to get to the same outcome. In this case, the outcome was getting people to wash their hands. And the solution that they found was to give them real-time feedback. So every time they washed their hands, there was an electronic board that gave them feedback saying, well done, 
and show them how the numbers of the current shift rate of washing hands went, went up. The people in the shift at the time? The people in the shift. So this was really good because immediate rewards is something that we know is very effective at changing behavior. Rewards that you get immediately, you do something and immediately I tell you, wow, great. Or I give you even money or, you know, it could be monetary, non-monetary, that has a lot of effects. So that is a great way to change behavior because you're not asking someone to change behavior in order to avoid some bad thing in the future. You're telling them, well, change behavior because you're about to get something really good now. And that is really, really effective. And people also love to see progress. So they do something and things are like moving up. That is great. There was a one person who, who heard my, my talk in another conference and he came back and said later, and he said, yes, we had a problem where a client was about to go elsewhere because, you know, we weren't giving them uh, ways to save money. But he said, you know, I'll give you a month to find some solutions. And so he went back to his team and said, well, you know, we have to find this solution for the client. And then he put like a big board in the common room of the team. And every time, and he was just assessing their development. So... You know, what they had to do was find ways to save whatever thousands of, of dollars. And every time they did, they put it on the board as like, okay, we made progress this amount, this amount. So they could see it going up. And seeing progress is something that really motivates people as well. And again, it was emphasizing the positive, not emphasizing we have to do something now, otherwise a client's going to go, which right. is causes people fear. And fear actually causes inaction. So fear can demotivate and causes us to freeze and not actually to do things and to become more creative. There's a, a kind of, they've been shown to be a correlation between positive feelings and creativity, for example. And does that hold for all different kind of personality types? Yeah, so definitely there is in everything, there's individual differences and everything is a scale. So some people are really responsive to immediate rewards. Some people, I don't care as much, right? Some people are really responsive to social incentives. They really care about what other people are doing. They want to do the same. Some people are more individualists, so they don't care as much. They want to be their own person. So in everything, there is definitely a scale. And if we're trying to target a specific population or a specific person, it's good to know what are their mental state? What are their personality measures like? Are they usually, so most people are optimistic, but not everyone, right? About 80% of the people are, and then 20% are not. They're pessimists. So that could make a difference. That could definitely help to tailor our techniques. So when you put your old economics hat on and look at what you've learned about how the brain works and how the influential mind works, where do you see applications of that, either to the realm of economics or in finance or investments or how people make financial decisions? So I, I think the kind of biases that we talked about are very prominent, you know, the confirmation bias. It's been shown that, for example, if you make a financial decision and then you straight away see information that confirms it, you're more likely to make the decision again. But if you make a financial decision and then you get information that disconfirms it, it shows it's not wasn't a good idea, you are still going to make the same decision again. <laughs> so these kind of they, these kind of thing and overconfidence. I mean, obviously that is is a big thing in the finance. People tend to be overconfident in general. So we don't really have data on whether people in finance tend to be more overconfident than the rest of the population. We do know that entrepreneurs, though, tend to be more optimistic than the rest of the population. And that once they become entrepreneurs, they become even more optimistic. And it makes kind of sense, right? In order to become an, an entrepreneur, you have to be comfortable with taking risk. And one way to be comfortable with taking risk is to underestimate them. And on the other hand, we know that lawyers tend to be less optimistic than the rest of the population. We don't know if it is pessimists that decide to become lawyers or whether once they become lawyers, they become pessimistic because they always need to think about the worst case scenario. To my knowledge, there is no, no research on people in finance. There is research on CEOs. So again, CEOs tend to be more optimistic than the rest of the population because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy to some extent. You know, you need to believe in yourself in order to try hard and, and go forward. Yeah. So one of the things we see around the world at investing is this notion of a home country bias. You know, people in the U.S. tend to invest more in U.S. securities, people in Europe, Europe, Asia, Asia. How does that tie in with some of the things you've learned? Yeah. So I mentioned this in, in my book. This goes back to control. 
and familiarity. So people like to invest in things that are closer to them, either topically or geographically. And I think one reason, one reason is just, well, they're more familiar. But that's not everything. We have this illusion that we have some, some control, as if we, we have a, a bit more control about our own economy, right? But we don't have as much control about the economy like in a country that's halfway around the world that we don't know the culture and so on. So that, again, is related to agency and control. But that also means that if you want someone to invest in your own company, what you want to do is highlight how your company is very similar or has common characteristics as the investor, whether it is anything really, any similarity would help. And if that notion of control and familiarity is a large driver in the home country bias, is that necessarily a bad thing? It depends what your country is. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. But if so, people making decisions have to be comfortable with those decisions. And is it the case that they'll be more comfortable? They may not know why that it's due to control or the perceived control, but ultimately they're going to be more comfortable anyway. Is there a case to be made that that's just wrong as it, as it relates to how people, quote unquote, should be investing their money? Right. So it depends what the goal is. So what you're touching upon is this idea that perhaps our goal is not actually to make the most amount of money. Perhaps our goal as human beings is not like material at all. And it isn't, right? To some extent, we have different goals. And one of our goals is to increase our well-being and our happiness. And so we would often make decisions, even when it concerns to finance and money, that won't necessarily enhance the bottom line of our bank account, but it will enhance our well-being. So for example, as you say, if I make a decision to invest in something that's closer to me, because in some, you know, I have this illusion that I have some control over it and that reduces my anxiety. Well, that's good for my well-being. It won't necessarily be good for my bank account. It depends, right? It depends whether what I'm familiar with is something that is lucrative or not, but it will enhance my well-being. And then definitely there's something to be said about that. So it's kind of this balance about what am I trying to optimize and could I perhaps optimize both? And is well-being in that sense mean sort of that level of comfort with the way you're investing? Well, I mean, when I say well-being, it's our psychological state and our physiological state. Anxiety affects our well-being negatively, right? And, and actually, there's a lot of research showing agency affects it positively. So people who have a sense of agency, of control, they're less likely to be depressed. They're more likely to be healthy as well because the two are very much correlated, our mental state, our physical state, and vice versa. I'm imagining, okay, if your well-being is higher, maybe in that moment that it is or maybe it's not the optimal investment decision. But if your well-being is better, the next time around, you'll make at least a good decision, if not a bad one, or if it's not sort of leading down a road where if your well-being is compromised, you might not make good investment decisions in the future. I don't think, I, I, you know, the two are not necessarily correlated. So decisions that are good for our psychological state are not necessarily the same ones that are good for a bank account. So for example, sometimes it's really important to take lots of risk. Risk makes people anxious, but not everyone. Some people are risk tolerant, some people are risk aversive. And so, so it depends. But you could imagine a risk aversive person who really needs to make a risky decision because that's good for their bank account, but not for their well-being. So the two are, don't go together. But then another person who loves risk. And so it will actually, it actually fit. So it really, you, you know, you really need to think about each individual case what is a decision and is it enhancing ones but not the other? And is there any way to reconcile it? One of the other things you talk about in your book is this notion that people trying to pick stocks also have this almost do it because of an illusion of control. And that, you know, so much of our world is this question of do active managers who are picking stocks add value compared to just buying the index? How does that sort of play out in the same way? Yeah, so we did a study where we had people play a game that's a little bit like picking your own stocks, where they could make their own decisions or give an, an expert an opportunity to make decisions. And they knew how well the expert was, was. So they knew the success rates of the experts, and they had some sense of their own success rates. So some people were underconfident, some people were overconfident. So people didn't really assess their own ability very well. 
and there is some contribution for being overconfident for why people want to make their own choices. But even after taking that into account, people still would rather make their own decisions rather than give it to an expert whose success rate is higher. And the reason that we concluded what, what's driving that is the extra benefit of control. So just having making a choice feels good. And that's kind of things that people desire. Even if they know the outcome's less favorable. Yes. Even if they know the monetary outcome is less favorable. Yeah. Um, it gives them some other type of reward like we were talking about. It's a psychological reward. I've always been curious about how, how the mind works and what is it? Is it emotion that's driving these kind of decisions? Absolutely. It is. I mean, I think it's definitely emotion. The problem is that people kind of think about the word emotion in ways perhaps that's different from what I think about or, or neuroscientists think about. So the way that, that evolution kind of build our brains is that in order to direct us towards certain decisions and not others, it came up with this thing, I mean, this is, you know, metaphorically speaking, called reward. So good stuff that will enhance our survival in general would be associated with a reward. And that includes sex, so we can have kids, and food and water, so we can survive. So all of these things are associated with a reward, which is basically a good feeling. And then things that can be dangerous and can limit our survival were associated with negative feelings, with anxiety and fear. So if we think about having predators or something like that, then we have a negative feeling. And so those feelings, good or bad, are what's driving our decisions and they're supposed to be driving our decisions it is the information that that is supposed to be calculated in our brain added together and drive our decisions and so you could call that emotion and every sort of emotion is a signal or information that goes into the decision making for good reason. You want to have that. People who have impairment in the brain, for example, they have you know some kind of problem in a specific part of the brain, and as a result, they don't have these signals. They don't have a reward signal. They don't have emotion. They have a very hard time making decisions. For example, people who have, there's a part of the brain called the orbital frontal cortex, and that is really important for value, so for being able to value different options, when I say value, again, valuation is simply reward signals in the brain. More, a higher reward signal means, oh, that's more valuable for us. So let's say you really like chocolate cake and you don't like carrots. You see chocolate cake, you get a re high reward signal and the orbital frontal cortex takes that into account and makes, you know, helps you make a choice. People who don't have those signals, they can't make choices, basically. They're just like paralyzed in making choices. And so you want that to be a factor when making choices on the same level it can drive us to choices that are not always good for us because that's that's the truth about anything like sugar sugar is important for us right we need it to survive but on the other hand too much sugar is not good so emotion is really important for how we make decisions for anything that we do for any action but obviously it's not it doesn't always drive us to the right way one of the things that I'm thinking about as you're walking through this is decision-making processes of teams and our business off tough and small teams. How do you take what you've learned about control and emotions and biases and help someone who's either tasked with making a bunch of decisions themselves or a decision process that involves maybe it's subordinates or, or peers or people on a team? Are there tools that you can take out of these lessons and say, okay, we can improve our decision-making process by doing these things. Well, one, one thing with teams for sure is that we need to take into account our tendency to conform. If most people agree on something, we think that's probably right, and then we'll go along with it. And so this is a problem when making decisions together when everyone's around in a team. And so in order to tackle that, one good thing to do is to have people write their own opinions down before things are discussed. Or if there's an, you know, you need to make a decision, you start to say, okay, anyone who's like for it, put your hands up now before even discussing it. So you put a hand up and then you know who's for, who's against, and then you can start discussing why. But if you just have... And by say, the way, does that act of putting your hand up, do people look around the room... Yeah, and well, first, almost instinctively conform because they see someone else's hand up. Okay, 
okay, so this is a possibility. And so one thing to do is just to have them write down before, right? You write down and then say, okay, what did you write down? Were you for? Were you against? What were your reasons? And so things are written down before people start discussing it. And it's also been found that discussion is important. So it could be that the majority, we shouldn't go with the majority. So putting your hands up doesn't mean that's the end of it. Or, you know, voting doesn't mean the end of it. Because majority often can be wrong. So you want people to have some kind of commitment in advance to what their opinion is just so it could be heard. But then once it's heard, it's perfectly fine to change your opinion based on information perhaps that you didn't have, right? So discussion is important as well. So we kind of want to to make sure that there's not too much conformity. At the same time, we want to necessarily hear what other people are saying. And then the other thing that, that I mentioned earlier in the talk was overconfidence, right? So one mistake one mistake that we do is just we go with the majority. We think, oh, majority is, is good enough. No. And the other thing is we go with the most confident person in the room, the person who talks more than others that have shown to be correlated with thinking that they probably know what they're talking about and talks more confidently. So we have to, to make sure that we realize confidence does not equal yeah. competence. Although, like, you know, that's one heuristic that we have. We have this heuristic. We think that confidence in our mind is like, oh, confidence, they probably know what they're doing. But we need to make be aware that that's not the case and ask for the actual facts, for the actual data before we make decisions. Is it normal that if you have a team where there's a lead decision maker and then they're supporting researchers, let's say, Is there a a tendency to just defer to the head in a sort of same same way, like the the notion of whether it's confidence or competence or perceived competence because there's, say, a chief investment officer and they're the leader of the team. And then you have other people that maybe have different or more information about a specific decision, but ultimately aren't the decision maker. And how how do you navigate around making sure you get as much information as you can on the table in an unbiased way before decisions need to get made. Right. So again, you know, you can have people put their opinions and and reasons for it before they know what the lead team person thinks. What new research are you working on? Well, um, so we have, you know, I have different people in my my group and they're interested in, in different things. What the one thing that kind of is similar in all the research that I do is to try and figure out what the influence of emotions or affects are on our decision making and memories and so on. So some of the things that we're especially interested in is how do people make the decisions of what to know and what not to know? So how do we decide what kind of information we should search for and what kind of information we actively ignore? There are some basic rules that seem to be true for most people, but there's great individual differences as well. What are some of those basic rules to start with? Oh, so basic rules is in general, on average, we'd rather get the good news than the bad news, right? So if we think it's probably good, we're more likely to seek out. If we think it's bad, we're more likely to say, no, I don't want to know at all. Or maybe I want to know, but not immediately. Is that tied to confirmation bias? Confirmation bias, it is, it's confirming what you already believe. Now, imagine that I have a negative belief. That I don't want to confirm it. You see, I have a positive belief. I do want to confirm it. But you're right that that also relates to con- that there's another thing, which is confirmation bias. I'd rather have information that confirms what I believe than, than don't. But that's that's a bit different. So that's the first kind of normal heuristic. That is one heuristic. Another one is when things are very, very uncertain, that does tend to cause people to want information because we don't like high uncertainty. We feel anxious when things are really uncertain. So big changes make us anxious and then we want to get information about it. There's like the, the what happened with Brexit, which p- people started going into on the web and searching for information about Brexit after it was decided that it's going to happen because that was, okay, something's really big happening. There's a big change but I don't know what it is, right? <laughs> and so big changes make us want to to understand what's going on because uncertainty is something that we don't like. Another thing is, is pretty obvious is information is useful. So if information is something that I could use to get to better outcomes, I want it. But here's the thing. Those three things don't always go together. Something information is useful, but it's very negative. So there's these conflicts. And how people make those choices, there's great individual differences. And it's really interesting to try to predict and understand those individual differences. Let me give you an example. Would you like to know now if you have a genetic disposition for certain cancers? If I had this information, would you like me to tell you now? Not on podcast. Well, right. In general. (laughs) You would or no? Um, 
I think I would. Okay. So when you ask people about this, about 58% say yes, right? And 42% say no. Now, this is useful information. You could use it to make decisions that will prolong your life. And that 42% of the in, of individuals do not want it. In fact, in, some, in one study, people gave lab samples for something else. And then the test was conducted on those samples. And then they went back and asked, this was, exact, this was done in females, and they were asked, we tested to see if you have the Barca gene that makes you more likely to have breast cancer. Do you want to know? Again, most people said yes about almost 60%, but then about 40% said no. So what makes certain individuals want information under certain circumstances and others not? We don't really know. We have some hypotheses about what could matter. I mean, does age matter? Does like your likelihood to be depressed or anxious? Does your mental state, does your stress levels, what matters? Can we predict it? These are really important questions, I think, always, but it's really important today when people spend a lot of their time either seeking information or have information out there. And the question is, do they want it? Yeah, especially as we get more and more information with this explosion of of data and machine learning. What are your hypotheses in this research that you're doing now? Well, we oh, we <laughs> I shouldn't really be. It's too early to say. We have some data coming in, but it's really early. And some of our hypotheses are confirmed and some not. So it, it seems like it's going to be really interesting, but um, hopefully we'll have some more soon. Our first, our first study is hopefully going to come out that soon, and then we have a lot of other things. So I want to turn to a little bit of a, a fun application of this, if we can, which is we talked a little bit before we started about having kids. And yours are a little younger than mine. But as a mother, how do you think about either being aware of how you're going to try to influence them, knowing what you know? Yeah. So, I mean, I do. I do this all the time. I try out little things on them because obviously this is something that you deal with a lot. I mean, having little kids, half the time you're trying to get them to do things, right? You're trying to get them to eat healthily, to go to bed at the right time, to like be quieter maybe in certain situations. So I definitely do a lot of that. And I, I'll tell you some of the things that I do, but I was, I'm was i especially excited to hear about people who read my book, The Influential Mind, and then tell me about what they did and was successful. So one great example I had recently was actually from a journalist in Brazil. And he said that after reading the book, in order to get his kids to eat, he took eat vegetables, which they don't like. He took um, Legos and he said, well, every time you take a bite, I'm going to like make, I put another Lego on to create this tower. So they wanted every time, they really wanted to see this tower being built. And so every time they took a bite, he put another Lego and another Lego and it really worked. This is using the principles of immediate reward and progress. Another uh, journalist from Germany told me that uh, she has two teenage boys. They don't like to go to bed on time. And so one day she usually says, well, you don't get go to bed on time. You're going to be very tired, right? She's telling them about the bad stuff that can happen and it doesn't work. And so after reading the book, she told them, if you go to bed on time, you will be better rested and you will look better for your girlfriend. And she said, this works. <laughs> so highly Highlighting the positive, not the negative. Yeah, Yeah. that's great. Well, let's turn to a couple of fun closing questions. What was your favorite sports moment? I was actually an athlete as a teenager and and then in college as well. I I run um, mostly long distance. And the first time I competed on a national level, and I have to say this is Israel. This is not like the U.S. or the U.K. When I moved to the U.S., U.K., I, I I was like on a different level. But in in Israel, I competed nationally. And my first big competition was cross country. And so my coach took me through first to kind of we walked to see like where I'm supposed to be running. And then the it started and we all started running. And I was, you know, I was okay. Maybe I was 10th or so. And then we got to a point where I knew we had to turn right, but everyone in front of me turned left because the first person made a mistake. So I got to that point and I thought, well, we have to turn right. So I did. And then everyone realized you have to turn right. And so everyone had to come back. (laughs) And uh, so I ended up coming in second because one person did uh, get before me. But, you know, I felt really kind of a little bit bad because it wasn't because I was one of the best there but because I simply knew where you're supposed to be running. But it was a great start (laughs) as one of my first (laughs) national competitions to get in second. It was a great boost. And probably a boost to your future profession, though you didn't realize it at the time. Which is making good decisions. Social (laughs) nonconformity. Nonconformity. That's true. That's true. It is true that one of my... 
I I tend to think that one of my traits is is nonconformist. Yes. All right. What skill do you wish you had that you decidedly don't have? Actually, this will totally contradict what I told what I just told you. I'm really bad at navigation. <laughs> that is one thing that I'm definitely bad in. I think I could be more socially, politically better. I tend to just, you know, I say what I think, and that's a good thing. But sometimes you need to <laughs> be better in in that kind of way. Do you think that's coming from a home country bias? Yeah, I think a lot of the things are cultural. I'm getting better at it. I've been I, I left Israel now 18 years ago, so I'm definitely becoming better. But a lot of the things that I definitely struggled with in the beginning and and still to to today are things that are. Okay, and 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 like common in in Israel because of the culture, but not so much in places like the yeah. U.S. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? Well, I mean, I don't know if it's necessarily teaching from my parents, but I think I took some ways of thinking and traits from them. So my father is an academic; he's a, a sociologist. He was a professor. I mean, he's re- still a professor. He's just retired. And my mom, although she wasn't、um, in the field, she was always like very interested and introspective about people's behavior. So I think that kind of combination of someone who is academically interested in social behavior and then another person who's always like thinking about what other people are, why are they doing it, what are they doing, and all of that. That is definitely something that. I can see in myself and in the career that I chose. What information do you read that you get a lot out of that other people might not know about? As a scientist, I I read the type of scientific articles that even if people outside my field would read, they are unlikely to to get what it means. I mean, even even within like neuroscience, if you read a neuroscience an, an article from a field that's slightly different, it'll be really hard to understand because it's different jargon. So I think as neuroscientists, we have this advantage that we really know the literature in psychology and neuroscience. We're able to understand it, and then it's our job to communicate it to others in a way that is understandable to other people. But people not in the field will have limited access to this. I tell you, what difficult decision did you have to make in the past that you feel great about today? Having kids. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, it wasn't like an obvious decision, and one that I'm very happy about. And, and you know, I I like being a mom、um, very much more than I would think. Now, Daniel Gilbert tends to say, not about me, but in general, that this is a confirmation bias of sort, or like a rationalization of sort that you're so happy that you have kids because you already have them and you put so much effort into it. But I do think that. They make me happy. <laughs> okay, great. One more. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life? Maybe being a bit calmer, and I want to say less neurotic. I don't know if that's quite right, but definitely as when I was much younger, and, and especially when I just moved to the U.S., there was kind of a lot of kind of anxiety about. Getting things right and being able to to get a get forward, which now the things that I kind of. Thought about seems ridiculous. Tali, thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. This has been fun. Hey, before you take off, I've started sending out a monthly email that shares a small selection of what caught my eye over the month. I get a lot of emails like this, and I'm sure you do too. So I'm only going to send no more than a handful of the very best things that caught my eye. If you'd like to receive that email, hop on my website at capitalallocatorspodcast.com and join the mailing list. 